All right, welcome everyone to the Thinking Creatively to Evaluate Student Learning During COVID-19 Policymaker Insights on Skip Year Growth Webinar. Thank you for joining us today for this important topic, especially given the recent announcement from the federal government regarding state testing waivers. Just a few quick notes before we get started. You can ask questions at any time through the Q&A feature. This allows all panelists to see questions you would like answered. Attendees will stay muted given the large number of attendees, so using the Q&A feature is the best way to interact with our panelists today. Now I would like to turn it over to our President and CEO, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, for some opening remarks. Javed? Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, thanks, everybody, for making time to be with us this afternoon uh, on this important discussion around skip year growth data. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank our, our friends and our partners in this webinar series, the Data Quality Campaign. It is always wonderful to work alongside another organization uh, It's dedicated to ensuring all students are receiving a great education uh, we know they deserve. Uh, so we're appreciative of your partnership in this webinar series. There's an, another part coming. Uh, we're working on the third part um, as we speak. In our first webinar series uh, last month, state leaders discussed uh, their experiences using Skip Your Growth in times of disruption and how they're thinking about using it this school year if statewide assessments are administered, uh, which we now know are coming uh, given the federal announcement. Well, with many states already in session, uh, and I appreciate both of our guests today that are actually in session, so making time away from session to be with us. I know how crazy your schedules are. But with the announcement coming from the federal government stating waivers will not be allowed, uh, but flexibility will be provided this school year, we know our legislators are working closely with state agencies and other partners to determine how to move state assessments uh, forward, uh, what is student growth and accountability decisions, what are they gonna look like? Uh, so today we're thankful to have two of our Hunt Kane Leadership Fellows, Representative Ashton Clemens from North Carolina and Representative Harold Love from Tennessee. Uh, both of them are gonna be providing insights into how their states are thinking about student growth and particularly skip year growth uh, this school year. To get our conversation started uh, today, I'd like to introduce our, our dear friend, uh, Nadja Young, who's the director of SAS's Institute's, Institute's Education Practice. Uh, she's gonna provide some introductory remarks uh, given the great work uh, SAS is doing around Skip Your Growth. And so thankful for your friendship and support, Nadja. Uh, thanks for making time to be with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to get our conversation started. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. And thank you, Cheryl, for having me. You know, this year has been truly unprecedented in the challenges that children, parents, teachers, all educators have faced. And I, I think we see a light at the end of the tunnel as far as the pandemic is concerned, but we now have the really important work to take on to understand how these rapid and unexpected changes to our school year uh, actually affected student learning. States are beginning to look towards the end of this 2020-21 school year and are deciding right now whether or not to you know, move forward with summative assessments as planned or modify based on some additional flexibility that uh, the US Department of Education has afforded and also think about how to measure growth over these past two years. So that's where I'll, I'll direct my remarks. Many states and districts like the one where I taught here in North Carolina have continued to assess students through benchmark and formative assessments over this school year. And that's been very informative uh, for daily practice in the classroom. While these assessments can be valuable inputs into uh, sophisticated growth models and value added models, there are, there's gonna be significant additional value coming from these statewide summative assessments if, if and when given in the spring to truly understand the pandemic's impact on teaching and learning, of course, and students' progress towards meeting their own individual academic goals. In fact, interesting, I found a survey this week that the National PTA and Learning Heroes had released that shows 52% of parents favor end of year spring testing, 25% surveyed were neutral and 24% were opposed. I, I think that's because most of us parents are anticipating a drop in student achievement on these upcoming assessments. That same survey showed that 62% of parents believe their child is behind where they would be in a normal school year, but we really don't know for sure until we measure. So that's one reason why it's gonna be imperative not only to measure achievement and proficiency, but also growth in any state that proceeds with their full scale, large scale spring assessment. Measuring student growth using a skip year model, so we'll shift into that approach now, allows us to see how much progress students have made over these past two years, but it also helps us understand the different impacts that the pandemic has had on different groups of students, because let's face it, 
students have had very different experiences learning remotely. We've heard a lot about learning loss, but surely learning loss has not been equal across all students. Some have not had consistent access to Wi-Fi devices, learning platforms. Others have been well connected and supported by tutors, learning pods, or family members. So what's the opportunity presented to us here with skip year growth data? By measuring growth across these very different experiences of students, we'll be able to determine where additional resources might be needed in the coming school year for sure. We can measure the impact of these different virtual and hybrid learning programs to see from a program effectiveness perspective, what's working, where should we make more investments or where do we maybe need to take a different approach. And then lastly, it can support a variety of research agendas, policy decisions, and of course, instructional practices. Many think that measuring skip year growth or measuring growth when there's been a gap in, in testing data is uncharted territory, but this is actually not, not a new challenge. In 2016, Tennessee, which we'll hear more about today from Representative Love, did not administer their summative assessments in third through eighth grade. Rather than measure growth from one year to the next as we had been for decades, SAS Institute built them a skip year growth model that measured growth over this two year period from 2015 to 17. So this sort of allowed us to test this notion uh, a few years ago. From our perspective, it wasn't so much the model that needed to change as it was the interpretation and some of those technical implementations or implications around the model. For example, we were more likely to have students who spanned more than one teacher school or district across that two year period. So let me show you a bit about how this is accomplished notionally. Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind sharing my first slide. How we do this is we leverage all available prior testing history as far back as we can for each student. In North Carolina, we begin assessing reading in kindergarten. So we have three data points in K through two per year for kids that we can include in these models. So for this hypothetical example, we're looking at a fourth grader in um, 2018. And we see we have a math an ELA and a social studies test score for that fourth grader. In 2019, they go into fifth grade. We now have a science test score for that student. And then in 2020, big question mark. We did not test. We don't know how they performed. But we can take all of that historical data from third grade or, or even earlier if we have it to make a, a two year assumption about how much growth was made once we get this next data point here in the spring of 2021. Um, simple gains models may not be able to accomplish this, but some statistical models certainly can accommodate all of this testing history, even if it's across different tests or across time accommodating that missing data. And so in this example, surely the student has moved from elementary school to middle school. So then we need to work on how to attribute and report on the growth uh, at the school level as we aggregate things. While you can see simplistically that this is possible, I'm sure everyone's wondering, is it reliable? For Tennessee, we used prior year's data to run some simulations to look at reliability. And we compared two years of growth measures with and without that missing year of data in the middle. Our simulation showed that not only is it possible, but the simulated skip year results were highly correlated to the actual uh, results that were observed in that same two year period, as much as a 0.99 correlation, which is very strong. So then the Tennessee Department of Education was able to trust and have some comfort in the decisions they could then make about which models to use and how to include those results in state policies. Now, I know part of what we're going to talk about today is also about learning loss. And so if, if we hop to the next slide, measuring learning loss is similar, but it's a slightly different modeling approach. So I think it's important just to make that distinction. In this case, we'd be using a predictive model to create a pre-pandemic expected score for each student. So we're going to use that same hypothetical student with the same testing history. And if we click on through, we see the same things in, in fifth grade and then the white dots show the prediction or the projection that we're going to make um, based on the average schooling experience. Now, of course, no student had an average schooling experience last year. We all understand that. And that's why we need to first use a robust model to reliably predict where they likely would have ended up on these 21 
um, assessments. And from there, we can then measure the learning loss. So one more click and you'll kind of see a hypothetical amount of drop from the prediction for this student. That's, that's how we get to that learning loss. And, and then from there, we can start to take a look at it across districts, schools, subject grade levels, and student groups. And it's going to be so important from an equity perspective to make sure that we're targeting the right interventions to the students that need it most. Overall, um, just to wrap it up, it's really important that we understand how the interpretations have changed with these measures. And ultimately, remember, it's a policy decision on how to include the information or not in any state policies. That said, I think it's really important information for educators to have access to, even if just for informal school improvement purposes. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Representatives Clemens and Love. Yeah, thank you, Naja. I think that was a really wonderful, quick uh, overview that was important on Skip Your Growth to really help set the context for today's conversation. Uh, and I'm going to remind our audience, but if you have questions for Naja uh, or the panelists, please remember to put them in the Q&A feature and we will get to as many questions as we can today. We are also recording this and we will have access to the recording um, as well as likely the PowerPoint slide if people want to see that afterwards. We often get requests for that as well. Um, we can make that available. Um, so now I'm excited to turn it over to our very important conversation today. And I'd like to introduce our panelists and get the conversation started. So both panelists are very dedicated to education and education policy in their states. And we truly appreciate the time they are taking out of their busy schedules to be here today to offer your insights into how states are thinking about policy related to student growth and particularly skip your growth this school year. So we welcome Representative Ashton Clemens from the North Carolina General Assembly and welcome Representative Harold Love Jr. from the Tennessee General Assembly. So we'll get our conversation started. Uh, Representative Clemens, I'm going to start with you. Uh, can you share what the conversation around student growth has been in North Carolina? Um, yes. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, thankful and excited to be here with the Hunt Institute and DQC um, SAS, who has been a wonderful leader in our state and across the country on how we use data to improve what's happening for our students and Representative Love. So um, North Carolina has had a commitment to caring about growth and our accountability standards. We actually added it to our accountability school report card in 1995. So it, it, valuing growth as a part of how we measure what's happening for our children and in our schools has been part of North Carolina's accountability history for a very long time. And we started incentivizing it in 1997. And so um, we're, that was our first teacher bonus program based on the growth of students, not the proficiency. So um, our state has had a long history of including growth as a measure of our schools. Um, and as in 2001, we started doing that by demographic. And so um, we have really, really been trying to understand what is happening for individual students based on where they're starting and the growth compared to what happens for them and their classroom across the state for a, for a while here in North Carolina. Um, here currently we have a measure of school accountability is 80% um, proficiency for students and 20% on growth measure. We have a big healthy debate on whether that's the right percentage or not. Um, lots of people would like to see more of a focus on growth um, as our overall measure of our schools. Um, and I would put myself in that camp, but it is certainly a debate here in North Carolina, how much growth should count in our overall accountability compared to proficiency. And I would say other measures that we ought to be considering as well. Um, but I think it's important to know that in our state, it's been part of how we've been evaluating schools for a long time and that the debate on what that should look like uh, continues here um, and that SAS has been a huge partner in that. So that's a short, short version of what's happened in North Carolina so far. Thank you for that, Representative Clemens. And be sure, North Carolina is not the only state having those same conversations um, as well. So thank you for that overview. Uh, Representative Love, uh, will you go ahead and share the conversation around student growth has been in Tennessee? Thank you so much. And thank you for having us here for this wonderful conversation. Uh, just like other states, you know, we 
began to reevaluate uh, how it would evaluate teachers and what role student growth would, would play in that. We have had, I think now I'm on education committee for, oh gosh, my fifth term now. And, and so I've watched uh, us as we went through this whole process of race to the top, where we were trying to put in measures to improve student outcomes and those conversations and, and, and bills we passed certainly address those issues of, of growth and how would really evaluate, you know, how a student's performing in, in, in that particular class that they're in. And so for, for many of us, uh, we saw gains on our NAEP scores after we implemented legislation. And that reassured uh, us that the decisions we were making were the right ones. Uh, we still had concerns. I particularly had concerns because even in our NAEP scores, there was still this gap between uh, African-American uh, students and Caucasian students when it dealt with NAEP scores. And so always push for legislation and measures to close that, that gap. But like so many of us, just as we were starting to make gains, of course, COVID hit. And, and so we tried to focus on how we could best maintain much of what we were trying to do. And I know we have some questions, of course, that will, that will get to that piece. So I won't talk too much about that, but just to emphasize that, uh, you know, even in our, our teacher evaluation, again, we wanted to make sure that there was proof that students were growing. And I think it was fair to students because uh, sometimes evaluating how much I have grown in my own test scores uh, is, is important, uh, more important sometimes than how I compare to other students all across the state or, or how much proficiency I may have. Both great measures, uh, but when we're talking about you know, taking a child who's at a certain place and then getting them to be another place is always an important factor because you, you don't know what particular uh, background a child may come from. One thing I've also pushed here, and we've adopted legislation around that, was addressing trauma-informed policies in our state, uh, making sure that children who suffer from adverse child experiences and, and may have difficulty achieving certain levels of growth aren't uh, necessarily uh, penalized because they did not uh, meet certain uh, proficiency requirements. And also to make sure that teachers in schools did not get penalized because they had certain students who had certain backgrounds, but that growth piece gets to show how they've grown in that process. Yep, thank you, Representative Love, for that that overview from Tennessee. I think you bring up so many key points, um, you know, as we're thinking about the implications of all this as well, what we've kind of learned historically, you know, from student growth, I think is important. Um, and I'm gonna continue to remind folks, Naja's already in the Q&A answering a lot of questions. Um, so please make sure you get in there and ask any burning questions that you have, and we'll try to get them as well to our panelists uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and so Representative Love, I'm gonna come back to you for the next question. Um, and you know, given COVID-19, uh, you know, the change of students kind of moving remote instruction, the issues with access to broadband and technology, can you kind of discuss how things like that and the format of how assessments are taken will actually influence assessment administration, you know, sure. coming up this school year and maybe into next school year and how in ways that, you know, impact student growth or skip your growth, how it can be calculated. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, things happen in a legislative session that you have no idea will impact the next one because of something just popping up. And I, I bring it up because we actually had a situation with our testing module because we were going online and testing and because of the, the issue with broadband across the state and just the testing module, uh, we had to then say that we would then test uh, by, by paper, right? And so previously before COVID, we put a hold harmless policy in for, for tests before COVID hit. And of course, uh, because of COVID-19, we had to come back and evaluate uh, what we would do with regard to assessment and testing. I I'm thankful and very grateful that we had the insight to put together a, a commission on education, uh, recovery and innovation. And, and their task was to specifically look at ways to close the gaps uh, between uh, what happened in, in learning loss. And they looked at things ranging from, again, learning loss from kids being out of school, but also what impact broadband uh, inaccessibility would have on them. Because one thing we never thought about was you can't just say to a teacher, uh, go online and teach. Uh, because our education prep programs didn't train teachers to teach virtually. 
And so that was one thing the commission also considered was the fact that teachers were delivering content differently, children were learning differently, but then you also have the issue of broadband access. A few years ago, we had a broadband grant program that was designed to get broadband out to many of our, ur um, of our non-urban areas. Uh, we have about 77% uh, of our school district that identify as rural. Uh, we have about 17% that identify as suburban and about 6% that identify as urban. But the problem is that um, you can technically say that broadband has been delivered to a uh, uh, zip code if, I'm sorry, census tract, if one or two houses in a census tract have broadband access. So that was a problem, uh, identifying who really didn't have broadband access and, and, and that exacerbated the issue of learning loss. And so we began to say, well, what can we do to make sure that we do properly assess? And so we had a special session uh, before we began our session in January to effectively deal with that and pass three pieces of legislation out of that. One was another hold harmless bill that simply said, if your assessment results are going to benefit the teacher and they show student growth and they are at expectation or above expectation, you can use that, that assessment for your teacher evaluation. Uh, if it doesn't, it's still up to the teacher. It's all uh, the teacher and the principal's choice to be able to say, I want to use my, my growth data or not. And so I think that that helped out. We also had a literacy bill that addressed the issue of trying to combat literacy uh, at the elementary school levels, which I also talked about, again, uh, improving literacy training for our teachers uh, going to school to, to, to become teachers. But also we had a bill uh, dealing with uh, learning loss, which provided for a six weeks summer camp paid for by the state, a four week summer camp, and then a year long after school tutorial program for students to engage. And so we, we were proactive in our special session to try to address the issue of making sure that even though we would take assessments in the spring, we would have procedures in place in the summer and the fall following to make sure that we did have some catch up. Yeah, no, thank you for those learnings from the special, special session uh, that happened very recently. I think those are all important things to be considering and thinking about, um, especially given our audience, you know, a lot of policymakers thinking about what to do next. And you kind of led me right into the question for Representative Clemens, talking about educators and how to support them in all of this. Uh, Representative Clemens, you are an educator yourself as well. Uh, can you discuss how teachers and school and district leaders are thinking about student growth during this time? Yes. So I do want to say, as you said, I was an elementary school teacher and principal and central office administrator, but I actually spent all day on Mondays and Fridays in an elementary school um, helping as a media specialist because there's a uh, left in the middle of the year. So I only want to say that to say what our educators are most focused on is themselves surviving and being okay and their children surviving and being okay. So I want to own, um, I do think we need to have these conversations about data and our educators are, being heroes every single day. I see it in the schools that I'm in and the schools that my children go to. And I just want to own that before we dive into this question about how we hope that they can think about growth. Um, with that said, educators care deeply about wanting our children to grow. That's why they became a teacher at their core is because they wanted to positively impact children growing and learning. And so, um, I think when they're thinking about growth um, right now, particularly in this pandemic, there are three different ways that they would think about it. First is relative to the starting point of where this child was, um, whether that's where, where COVID started or at the beginning of this school year, what has the growth been for that child? So relative to where they started, have they grown, um, from where they started with me as their teacher or with me as their principal um, compared to the beginning of the school year or when COVID started. So I think that's one way we, they're thinking about growth. Second is relative to this expectation that we have on what the end, end goal that I have that kid for. So if I'm a eighth grade biology teacher, I'm thinking about um, how did this individual student grow, but also how far, how close did they get to the goals I had as my eighth grade 
um, biology teacher. And so, you know, we think about it that way as well. And then the third way to think about growth is relative to the other eighth grade biology students in this state. Did this, did this student or did the, did the students in my class or my school or my district, how did their growth um, measure or look relative to other children and students in that same subject area? So um, I think if I put my kindergarten, first, second grade teacher hat on, those are the questions I would be asking myself. And if I put my principal hat on or my district hat on, those would, are the questions of the students in my care relative to where they started, how have we grown, um, relative to this expectation that we have for children their age, how have they grown, and then relative to other students or schools or districts, um, where are we? So I think that's how I would think, be thinking about it now as educators, after I make sure everyone is loved and taken care of and have their food and everything that they need. Yeah, and definitely appreciate the call out for all our educators have done. Having been a former teacher and principal myself, uh, I definitely think they have done heroic work uh, given the circumstances we've all been in. But agree, they're the first job and they know, you know why they went in was to help students grow over time. So I definitely think those considerations uh, are very important. Uh, so let's see, next question for Representative Love. Uh, our partners in the series data quality campaign conducted a national parent and teacher poll in 2020, right in the midst of the COVID-19 school closures and found that 65% of parents and 61% of teachers said they wanted information about student growth while schools were closed. Naja kind of talked about this earlier with some other surveys that were just kind of polls that talked about the same thing. But can you discuss the feedback you are hearing? I know you just, we talked earlier about how you're out and about frequently on um, being in the community. How are parents and community members talking right now about assessments and, and student growth this school year in Tennessee? Well, I, I think that one thing that is abundantly clear uh, from many conversations is, is that all parents uh, wanted their children to be able to not have uh, a lot of loss in the school year. And so that was the starting point. Parents wanted to make sure that children were able to receive content and be able to understand it and, and keep going. You know, nobody wanted their child to stay in the same place they were. Uh, with that also, all educators wanted their students to be able to demonstrate growth. The, the problem came in, I think, with how then to do it. Uh, because again, I think many of us were anticipating a shorter window of school um, virtually given. Uh, many of us were expecting there to be a resurgence of uh, in-person learning once the fall came. And I'm speaking because I was on the uh, our CARES Act committee for the state to help distribute money to our, our local governments and other agencies. And so even here in Nashville, the, the mayor's office uh, put money aside to purchase uh, laptops. And this all feeds into you know, to what we're talking about because some of the laptops didn't get there because everybody was ordering laptops. And, and so parents were concerned because uh, the child is at home um, the parent is having to now be the support for the teacher and sometimes the teacher in, in the home. And if you have multiple children, then you have multiple assignments going on. And as a parent, there's one thing to assist your child in doing their homework. It's a whole other thing to be the teacher. Uh, you compound that with if you're the teacher and you have children. Uh, so now th this multiplies that. I think this feeds into the whole mental health aspect of the parents and of the children. Parents concerned that their child was not gonna be circling around in, in depression and isolation, but also mental health for the parent. And I think this is where we see that parents' concern was, uh, if I can just get my child back into the school physically, then automatically there's gonna be a possibility to salvage this year because they're gonna be in an environment where they're used to learning. And, and so I, I think that was our concern in the state of Tennessee was making sure that as we talked about going back into in-person learning, that we had parents understand that we wanted their child to be safe first. We wanted to make sure that the, the children and the teachers were going to be safe. And, and this would help parents understand that you know, your, your child cannot grow academically if the teacher in the classroom 
is nervous about COVID-19 being spread. And I think that's one thing that we didn't really talk about in the, in, in the state legislature was how impactful this fear of COVID might be for teachers. We had some teachers that got sick and some that died. And so these are real things we're talking about. But I will acknowledge again that the parents' uh, concerns were well founded to make sure the child does not um, it, it seems to have a year lost. And I think this is a valid concern. Yes, no, thank you for talking through kind of those complex feelings and emotions, you know, that parents are, are having, you know, while they're also dealing with this and, and thinking about what's best for their child, you know, moving forward. So thank you for that. I'm actually going to give Naja, if you're ready, I would like to actually, there's been some questions coming in just to give Representative Clemens and Representative Love a little break for a glass of water. Um, there's, well, I'll start with this question uh, because I do think it's really important given the feds saying that, you know, tests could be shortened. I think California has already uh, started working on shortening their tests from what I've seen in news articles. So, how might that change the analytics and interpretations of growth and or the prediction models used to estimate learning loss? I think it's a great question. It's a, an excellent question. I was actually just starting to type into that one. It's too much for me to type, better to be answered verbally. So thank you for throwing it my way. I, I think step number one is states need to talk to their assessment vendors because I was talking to an executive at a large national assessment firm this week who works with a large state and says, at this stage in the game, it's really too late to shorten tests. You can't just shave questions off. You have to make sure you're still hitting the key learning objectives and standards while also going through all the rigorous psychometric testing uh, that goes into the preparation of creating a test. Then it'd be very difficult to do in this short amount of time between now and spring. And for some states where school districts are operating on different schedules, some of those spring assessment windows are opening very, very soon. In, you know, later this month, or certainly in March and into April. That, so that's one aside. SAS wouldn't be involved in any of that, but it's an important question to in conversation to have. Once the data were to come to us, what we would be looking at if test questions were reduced, um, we would be looking, and we look every year at every test for this, at um, having adequate stretch in the scale. And what stretch in the scale means is that there's enough questions with enough ver variety of difficulty that you see a spread of student performance and you don't see students bumping up against say an artificial ceiling where a large percentage of students are scoring at that top scale score. If that happens, we cannot measure any movement or growth that they may have had because the, the test is not allowing for it. Um, it's tough. I can't give you a number based on what the exact cut is going to need to be that you need to have a, this many items on a test because the difficulty of items factors into it as well. Um, but I can say that the computer adaptive tests uh, help with the stretch in the scale and typically a safe number that we have been able to work with on computer adaptive tests is in the 40 to 50 item range. But this is just one of those things that we're going to be looking at very intently as soon as that assessment data starts to roll in to have conversations with our state partners about where it's going to be responsible and reliable and where we have some some cause for concern. Yeah, thank you for that. I thought it was such an important question coming up given some of the flexibility they've discussed. So thank you for taking that uh, pitch hit there. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. it. So Representative Clemens, I'm going to turn back to you um, for the next question. You know, given again, as your experience as an educator and policymaker, can you discuss the benefits of student growth during this time and share insights into the potential opportunities that could result from this pandemic? We kind of have a, we have a question in the chat really about, I'm trying to find it right now. Sorry, we have a lot coming in, um, you know, about the potential for, for what could happen in the future, you know, as a result of all this. So I think it directly relates to this question. I think this is a really important question because we have a great responsibility right now with how we make choices on how we're going to use data. Um, and everyone from state policymakers to um, companies like SAS to educators need to feel that responsibility in their hearts, I hope, as they make decisions because um, what we do want to do is learn as much as we possibly can about where our students are 
what was working, what was not working in this time period, we do want to do that work. What we do not want to do is take a system that has been stretched to the max and penalize students and penalize schools and penalize educators and penalize families based on data from this time period. So I, I wanted to say, I do think there's lots of opportunity with data and with that opportunity comes great responsibility for all of us as we start to make these decisions. Um, and this crazy time has given us like tests that we can study what's happened for kids that we never would have been able to do um, in the real environment. So um, we are going to be, at, one thing we can and should look at is we have districts in North Carolina and across our state that have been in person since August, since when school went back. Um, and we have some that have yet to go back in person. So that's a great test for us to see what are the changes and the impacts? And we need to be able to um, make sure some other factors are regulated and those kinds of questions, but um, we, we can test that. We have some schools that have stayed whatever plan they chose all school year. And we have some schools that open back up, then they close, then they're back open. So we can look at, do those changes in placements? How did that impact student growth and student data? Um, we have some districts who use pre-prescribed online curriculum options. So my own, I have twins in kindergarten and they are using some programs uh, that the district didn't normally use, but when they went to uh, this remote learning experience, they used some already, uh, you know, nationally created programs. So let's learn, right? Did those work? How are they helpful? So um, I hope that if we if we have a smart and responsible lens, we can learn about how our kids learn. What's the impact of all these things? How what are some programs that were really successful and that we can use data to do that? But we must not be using data to beat our educators and our children over the head. In general, I don't think we should be doing that. But it we really have to take that responsibility to heart right now with everything that they've been through. I think you're absolutely correct. And, and we had a question in the chat um, that I'm not sure we can ask, answer at this point in time, but it makes me think about that is where will the funding come from? You know, once we have once we have the data from whether it's skip your growth or whatever might come from the student assessments, like really where are we going to get the funding to then support educators and, and do all these things to address learning loss? So I think that's, that's a great question you know, moving forward, thinking about relief funding, uh, state budgets that will be coming up, all these different, you know, complex things that make it all move, you know, to help educators, um, you know, as they work through this information to help students. So I just wanted to acknowledge that question was in the chat, even though it's a very hard one to answer, but a very valid question. Um, Representative Clemens, I'm actually going to come back to you. Um, and it kind of goes in that vein of the funding, but I, you know, I think this is something for state leadership to think about, uh, given your experience as a teacher as well. How can states support teachers if skip year growth is used this school year to ensure it helps them prepare for instruction over the summer and into the upcoming school year? Because I think that's, that's the really big question, right? If we have this information, what is it really, how are we gonna make sure it actually benefits students and schools on the ground and how can states do that? Yes, it's a great question, and certainly um, I think a lot about that because it's easy to say as a school principal, this is what I would do, but that's not my role anymore, and so I have to think about it at the state level, what do we do, um, and the first thing we can do is we can have policies that make it safe to use the data with a learning mindset and with a um, mindset of what we're going to do to improve children's lives from here, so I think that's that's honestly our most important role, I believe, is that we first make it safe to do that work, which is why we want data to begin with. Um, and that we can also set an expectation that that can that that work happen. Um, you know, we that we do need this data. We do. We need to know where kids are. We're going to make it safe to do that, but we need we should have the expectation that we know where kids are. Um, and then 
We have this debate in our state. I'm guessing Representative Love does and all across um, the country, but we they need data in a timely manner to use the data to actually improve what's happening for kids. And that is not always what happens. And that's going to be a challenge now. Um, so I think that those are a few levers that we have um, at this state uh, to think about. And then I think, you know, when I said that educators are thinking about growth in those three different ways relative to where they started, relative to the goal, you know, we need to help once we have the data, um, we need to learn or help educators know the most effective way to intervene with students. So there are going to be, and there already are, you all see it too, lots of vendors who have the solution for learning loss and lots of things out there. And it's at our state role, we, we know um, with research what is going to be most effective. So it's our job to help direct we do have a lot of federal resources coming in to direct them in the way, the effective strategies to improve student outcomes. And lastly, when we are learning the things that worked in this time period, because I do think that some things have worked. Um, my daughter loves that she can finish her math and not have to sit there and wait and she can just keep moving. Like there are some things that have worked and it's also our job as policymakers um, to learn about those and to try and magnify the things that have worked to affect more kids across our state. So those are some things states can do. Yeah, and I'll, I think the same, yep, Naj, I was going to say you or Representative Love could also add to this about how you're thinking about supporting educators if once data comes out. So please feel free. Yeah, thank you. Representative Love, would you like to go first? You go ahead and I'll, I'll go after you finish. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I think states right now are grappling with the, the mechanics of this. How can we, you know, get the data, wrap our arms around it, build the right models to assess the situation and figure out what, what learning loss has gone on um, across our state. That's very helpful and, and a, of course the place we need to start. But if those data that comes from that analysis, that if it's just used for sort of a research purpose and that information is, sitting in a spreadsheet somewhere or sitting in a, a research report on a website somewhere, that is not actionable data that teachers can use in the classroom at, at that time. So we have to think about the what's next and those next steps. And I think this is a huge nod to both Tennessee and North Carolina who have invested funds you know, to make sure that a reporting system is provided to educators and they're not the only states, but but certainly it's they've done a really good job for a very long time. Pre, you know long before the pandemic to say, let's get a, a secure reporting system out there where folks can log in with role-based permissions so that teachers can see their students, counselors can see the students they're responsible for, learning uh, specialists, if you're a, a reading specialist or a math specialist or an English language learner specialist, you can log in and get access to those students, you know, so they can actually dig in and see not just the reflective, you know, what happened, how much learning loss occurred or how much growth occurred last year, but from a diagnostic perspective, how did we do working with different types of students who have different characteristics, different types of, of backgrounds and, and learning needs? Um, so the ability to kind of interact with it and generate lists, generate lists of groups of students that um, their projections are not looking so strong and they're gonna really need some strong supports pull those together on the fly in our school improvement team. I see it happening. I see it happening in my daughter's elementary school um, because I serve as the parent volunteer on that team. They're actually doing these types of things with the tools in hand that they can then attach the right interventions. Or who are the students that maybe didn't show a, a lot of learning loss? They, they kept pace. They even did pretty well. And my gosh, we don't want them to be kind of left behind. What are we doing to make sure that they're getting the right kind of rigor to make sure that they're really meeting their potential in terms of college career readiness and so on and so forth. So Ashley Benkin asked a similar question, but I think that's key is how do we get this information in a usable way into the hands of educators? Yep, and Representative Love, do you have anything you wanna to add to that conversation? <laughs> Uh, just that when we get the data back, uh, that I hope that across the country, uh, we abandon uh, what I think has been a perception of either or, either we support students or we support educators. Uh, it can be a both and situation. I mentioned race at the top that we did in Tennessee. Uh, 
and there was a feeling of uh, if we didn't focus on students, uh, then, then we were abandoning teachers. Uh, so we had to focus on students more and, and, and almost be punitive to teachers uh, because it, 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 they, it was presentation that we had been supportive of teachers for so long that we abandoned students. And we have to leave that model alone. Uh, that model doesn't help anybody. And so if nothing else, I think everyone has seen how valuable and important our teachers are uh, because they are the ones delivering this content to our students. And so that's my hope is when we get this data back uh, that we, again, don't put it on the shelf. Uh, we don't write it off, but we also uh, make an attempt to make sure that we adopt a both and model that we can support our teachers with higher pay. Uh, also that we can support our teachers with more incentives for scholarships to go to college and be teachers. Uh, that we can also look for ways to give them also opportunities for professional development that, that centers around their own mental health uh, as they deal with the challenges of, of students coming to classrooms. Yeah, thank you. I like that, that idea of the both and. Uh, I think that's really important because if we don't take care of teachers, we can't take care of the students that are in their classroom. Um, so I definitely agree it's a both and situation we need to be thinking about. Um, Naja, I think I'm going to turn to you quickly um, just for some technical questions that have come in. Uh, the, what happens if a state goes two years without testing data? Is skip year growth advisable or doable in those extremes? Well, it, it's certainly still possible. And I think it's important that with any measures you put out, these are estimates. St you know, statistics and statistical models yield estimates of what the growth results were or the learning loss was. And so it's important that we also are transparent and show a, a level of uh, error or a confidence interval around any estimate that we put out. So certainly when we put out reporting, that's that's there for folks to see. Um, so the, the farther we go, the bigger the leap we have to make. And if we have to make a jump across two years, it's going to create some challenges. It's possible, yes, but you're going to have more students that then are spanning certainly not only elementary and middle, but maybe middle and high, you know, many more students that are spanning multiple schools, which means that, again, the inferences become challenging. How do you then aggregate the growth measures for a school to actually help them with school improvement when there's so much different attribution going into the model? Um, but also, it, you're going to start to see some confounding impacts of the normal summer slide that occurs you know, compounded with the COVID um, slide. And, you know, we, we can kind of deal with it over the, this one year gap and we'll deal with it again if we have to over the two year gap, but it, it's going to get more um, challenging as those things get muddled together in the data, harder to isolate. Yeah, but I'm gonna throw one more to you as well, um, because I do think this is something we, we know is going to happen given that a number of students have like have been absent, you know, from remote learning. We have a lot of missing students, I think has been the term out there. Um, but if they're absent from standardized testing this spring, how valid and re reliable can we really say the results will be on a state level? And I think I would add to that, you know, like what can we do once we know who those students are? Like what should we be thinking about as, you know, state policymakers, state leaders? Because to me, that in from that data alone, we will need to do something with, right? The fact that that many students are missing from taking assessments, um, I think is something may maybe Representative Clemens or Love could respond to as, as well, thinking through that. But Naja, I'll go to you first, talk about the technical side. Sure. This one really is, again, one where technically, you know, we will run the models with the students that do take the test and we'll, we'll report out in a transparent way um, you know, where we didn't feel we get the, got the right end counts, the right, you know, the right number of students in a given um, grade or subject it, down at the school level. If, if we're not doing these um, analyses at the classroom level, that's not quite as concerning. Um, if we're really focusing on the school and subject and grade level, we're, we're probably going to get the end sizes that we need in most places. Um, when you get down to the classroom level, that's where it might start to, you know, the, those shaved down numbers might become problematic. And so fewer teachers may, may have results. Um, however, I think ultimately this really is a policy question because the models can be run and we run them in, with multiple states in different ways. Some are based on enrollment, you know, versus attendance and some are based on, on days of attendance that students must have actually been in school a certain number of days, but that's very much a policy decision. 
Yeah, and Representative Clements, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I see um, you unmuting. <laughs> I think it's um, a hard question, and it comes back to the responsibility aspect, I think, of, of how we use data. Um, so I, I hope and believe that if we make it a safe space to get data, that we give multiple avenues to help as many families feel comfortable as possible, we will get the majority of kids um, and get that information from them. Uh, and so I think when we know what that number is, we have to decide what is the responsible way to move forward with the data based on that number. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it. But I mean, we, at, at my, where my kids go to school, when they were just doing recent assessments, my kids are in person, so they did them in person. They set up where you could come, if you're a remote student, you could come in a small group of six, but they were also willing to set up one room with one adult and one child if a family felt very strongly about not having their kids even in a room of six. So if we're willing to go and do all those things, I think we can meet most of our students' needs um, and family needs to get as much information about as many kids as we can. Um, and, and there may be places where that's not, not the case, and we ought to think about what that means for how we use that data. But I do think as long as we give lots of options, we'll get most of our kids in. I think Representative Clemens used the, the most important word in this responsibility. Right, we gotta be responsible with this data because what we don't need to do is project this data as speaking for all kids and, and then use that to say, well, this is, this is where all of them are. And so we have to be responsible going forward to make sure that uh, if we see that there were gaps in students who took the test, took the assessments, they would still reach out to find out uh, what happened there and then make earnest attempts and then be intentional about getting some results uh, and make sure that we then correct uh, whatever issues were, were there in that student's uh, learning situation. Because we had a situation uh, just very briefly last summer where um, it was reported out that our students had experienced a certain percentage of learning loss. And we got all upset because uh, this came from the Department of Education and we had just had a meeting with the commissioner the day before, a press release is sent out, but then we come to find out that they were citing data from three years ago that was a projection. So now we're like, well, hold on now. You're citing a projection from three years ago of what might happen if we had learning loss, but you pre presented it as we've had this kind of learning loss. And so you gotta be responsible with data because it, people will hear a snippet and, and that'll cause more problems than, than good. Yes, completely agree with that. And I keep thinking through uh, the collaboration at pretty much every level that's going to be needed now that we know state assessments will occur, data will be gathered, right? It, it will require vendors, state leaders and departments of education legislators to really talk together to think through, right? Like the appropriate use of all of this, then what comes from the, the use of the data and the support. So I think that this is gonna require quite a different uh, conversation than we've probably had around student growth before. This is really gonna quite require some collaboration. Naja, I see you nodding your head. Do you have thoughts about that, you know, as a vendor, your experience with that and, and what that might look like and um, yeah, I mean, the collaboration is is going to be so important that that SEAs and LEAs are sharing more, you know, some of these questions that are coming into the, the chat are really about, well, gosh, how do we know which kids did virtual, did hybrid, did in, in school instruction, if that information is, is known at the LEA level and can be shared at the SEA level, then we can start to do some of this, this greater research that can be so informative and answer the types of policy questions that the representatives have raised today. So I think the collaboration across SEA and LEAs are gonna be critical as well as perhaps across government agencies. Someone else asked a question about how do we find children that have left the public school system? Maybe they're being homeschooled, maybe they're in private school, um, but you know, once they're off our off our uh, student information systems, we don't know how to find them. So collaboration across government agencies, perhaps education, social services, health and human services to make sure that, that kids aren't falling through the cracks and that they're, they're being served. And then having a strong, you know, 
statistical partner to help you wrangle this data because it's not going to be as clean as it used to be. It's not going to be as straight of a dotted line, you know, where, where everything links as well as it once did. There were always data quality challenges with education data. Um, it, it's just gotten worse. So, you know, some SEAs and LEAs have really strong capacity in-house for that kind of work. Others don't. We'll have to seek partners. And I'm hopeful that there'll be technical assistance coming from the U.S. Department of Education as well. Yeah, and that would be my guess, given you know what they announced this week and and the push to collect more data uh, nationally. I have a feeling that that will likely be how it moves forward um, as well. So I know we're running out of time, and there are still so many questions in the chat. So what I will do is. Representative Clemens and Representative Love, if you just want to take one minute to close on any final thoughts, you feel like you haven't, you've had something to say and it hasn't gotten addressed, um, please feel free to do that. Representative Clemens, I'll let you go first, then we'll turn to Love and then we'll close because time is running out on us already. Um, I think I would just say that we have to, at our heart, ask, um, how do we use this moment to long-term improve what happens for each and every single child that's depending on our state um, in North Carolina and on our country and on our public schools for their opportunity for success? And so um, whatever we're doing and whatever conversation, um, particularly with how do we use data to learn how to do that better, um, I think we have to keep at the core as we're moving forward from COVID-19. Thank you for letting me be part of today. Thank you, and Representative Love. Again, thank you so much for having me on here also. I, I echo the sentiments of my colleague from North Carolina. Uh, the, the one thing I do wish we were able to do in Tennessee was to focus more on our high school students uh, because I, even our measures to help remediate some learning loss with summer school was only focused on our middle school and elementary school students. So um, that's the concern I have. We'll be trying to work on some stuff this session to help them out also. But I'm, I'm excited about uh, helping our teachers and students over overcome uh, what we've all experienced as a situation that none of us expected to see. And I believe in the resilience of our students and, and our educators, and we'll keep pushing for this both and perspective and, and not an either or. Yeah, and thank you all, Naja. Thank you, Representative Clemens and Representative Love. I feel this has been a really enriching conversation. Um, as Javade mentioned, we are actually going to have a third webinar in this series, given all the changes that have occurred. We don't have all the information together yet, but look, if you are here or you're registered, you will be getting that information to join us for a third webinar uh, on, this, on this topic. Um, we're also putting in the chat two links to resources um, on skip year growth that will help, I think, provide states some more information. So look for those resources in our chat. And I'm also going to quickly share my screen and let you know that we continue to have a variety of webinars on all kinds of topics related to COVID. Um, so please join us next week. We have one on supporting elementary principals as early childhood leaders. And then we also have one on post-secondary completion in the age of COVID-19. In the chat will also be a link to where you can register and see all of our webinars. We hope you will join us for these continually important conversations that we are having. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to panelists, Naja. Thank you to our partner, DQC. Um, we're, we've run out of time, so please everyone stay safe and stay well. Thank you.